You can go back to the archive session. Maybe Scott will show you how to do that. I don't know how to do all that. <laughs> it's so easy. And, <laughs> I, and, and he'll do that if we have some other new members here. Who are having Come over and show me. <laughs> yeah, I will. Happy to. It's okay. I, I pick up plenty of it. <laughs> okay. So um, tonight we're going to be talking about autoimmune uh, disorders, but before we do that, we want to see if there are any new members and see if anybody wants to let us know how you found out about the classes and uh, what you might expect to get from them. We're just curious. You don't have to, but it's helpful for us to know. Anybody new? I'm new. And is that constant? No, it's uh, Leanne. Yes, my name is Leanne. Hi, Leanne. Hi. I um, was told about this from Dana Jacobs. It's Dana Jacobs, yeah. And I know I also know the Stanleys. Hi. Hi, Leanne. It's Hello, good to Leanne. See you. <laughs> <laughs> They're by some of our favorite people right there. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. welcome. <laughs> welcome to the family. And uh, uh, come to a couple few classes and decide whether this is something that will be valuable for you. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else new? There's Dana right there. Yeah. Say hi to Dana. Hello, Dana. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Virgil. Marilyn and Leanne. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dana, thanks for sending along our last participant. And, and hello to the rest of you today, too. Anybody, oh, anybody else who's new? You don't need to be shy. It's OK. <laughs> no one's shy. Um, or everyone's shy. You don't even have to show your face. You can just have a blank screen. Hey, Charlie. Hey, go ahead, Mayor. Hey, uh, I'm not anybody new. In fact, I'm somebody old. I'll be celebrating 70 this weekend. Oh, well, <laughs> congratulations to you. And I've planned the menu. It's all plant-based. Uh, <laughs> that is wonderful. I'll probably have a lot of food left over. <laughs> uh, well, Saturday's my birthday too. And I think my plans are all falling to crap. So okay. if you got extra food, I guess I better come over there. Yeah, you can. <laughs> it sounded a bit like Ken. It is Ken. <laughs> hey. This yeah, is. It is Ken on the iPhone. Yes. This is the first time I've done this on the iPhone. Okay, well, it works. I'm busy right now doing that uh, resistant exercise with the backpack. Uh, we're happy to see that. Good for you. <laughs> and thanks for sharing that with the others so they can see that you can actually be exercising while you're coming to class. <coughs> I'm in the Awesome uh, Oregon Badlands Wilderness east of Bend. There's lots of lava and juniper trees. <coughs> nice. Good dedication. All right. Let's see if we have any other comments from anyone. Anyone have any concerns, questions? Apparently, we don't have anybody else who's new, but we have a lot of people who have been here before. So. Uh, you may have some questions or concerns that you would like. Scott. I got a question, Charlie. Go for it, Virgil. Is in my rocking chair here in my office now. Is that exercise? Uh, <laughs> it's not quite the weight bearing that we're looking for if you're worried about osteoporosis or if you're trying to do the muscle strengthening. However, it is some movement, which is better than no movement. <laughs> <laughs> Very cute. I have a question. 
Uh, how about weeding? Cutting grass <laughs> and weeding with the big scissors. Weeding, gardening is exercise. It's not weight-bearing exercise, but it is exercise and it's a healthy activity. So if you like gardening, that's good. Good, I did a half an hour walk and a half an hour uh, the yard work, you know, so I'm good. good. <laughs> keep it, keep that up. And if I, you want to do a little bit more, that's okay too. Well, when it gets too hot, I can't do it. I hear what you're saying. So I'm wondering about um, apple cider vinegar. Is that considered um, our diet? Is it a health food? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a slightly processed food, but it's actually a healthy food. That's one of the slightly processed foods that's fine. In fact, it's recommended uh, by Gregor in his 21 tweaks uh, for weight loss. Uh, but I think there are other health benefits. I can't remember what they are right now for apple cider vinegar or uh, vinegar, plus balsamic <laughs> vinegar in general. Okay, because I was wondering if it's good to put on a salad. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. I have a question, Charlie. Yes, Ann. Um, if you know we're doing the the uh, whole foods, uh, a whole 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 grain uh, uh, three week cleanse thing with Judd, and um, not on there is that I could see is nutritional yeast because but nutritional yeast gives a nice cheesy taste to things. Is it really is it bad for one or do you think it's okay to use nutritional yeast? Yeah. Uh, I use nutritional yeast intermittently. Christine uses it intermittently. We don't use it every single day, but we okay. put it in soups. We, uh, she puts it uh, nutritional yeast when she uh, uh, shakes up tofu chunks. She cuts it into cubes and puts nutritional yeast with a little liquid aminos or coconut aminos and uh, squishes it around in the bag, and then air fries it. Uh, and it's a tasty treat. Uh, some people use it with popcorn. I tried that a few times. Most of it winds up at the bottom of the bowl, but True. just give a little taste. So there's yeah. nothing wrong with eating that. All right, thank you. I, I think by the way I've heard, I do, cannot verify it, that um, apple cider vinegar is good for arthritis. So I don't know. Scott, do you have any thoughts on that? No, no. I'm not sure. Yeah, I just know about the, the weight loss effects and it's great to put it's it's great to put on for dressings and things like that. Any kind of vinegar, balsamic vinegar, apple cider vinegar. But I know it stimulates an enzyme that helps to burn fat. So that's why it's one of the 21 tweaks for weight loss on and Dr. Gregor, as you mentioned. Actually, okay. I have one more question if I might. You um, might. You may. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, you know, Judd wants to lose weight and that's what he's been doing. And, and me going along with his diet, I'm really losing too much weight. And so what can I, can I add back in bread or what, what, what can I eat back, put back in my diet that I won't lose too much weight? Well, before I would comment on whether you're losing too much weight, I would ask you what your BMI is, your uh, height and your weight and then calculate your BMI. And if your BMI is above 19, I would tell you, uh, you may think you're losing too much weight, but you're actually at a healthier weight than what you were before. Now we have a certain image in our brain. We look around at other people and in the United States, we see everybody who's heavier than we are. And so we think we're too thin. Well, look at the pictures of what people look like in the 1940s and before, then compare what you look like compared to them. And if you're right. looking like them, you're not too thin. If you're looking right. like the average person today, then um, you're probably at a healthy weight and not losing too, too much weight. But if you decide that your BMI is well below the 18, five to 19, whatever, uh, and it's uh, down below that range, and you want to gain some weight, 
then you would add back in a few nuts and seeds and maybe avocado and you know healthier uh fats okay okay all right well but thank I you very add, much i wouldn't add bread necessarily because bread is is um a whole grain that gets processed stripping out fiber and other nutrients and it gets absorbed rapidly and uh the calorie density is higher but it's uh i believe in my mind it's more inflammatory so i i, I tend to eat bowls instead of things with bread okay, thank bowls. you thank you very much you're welcome mm -hmm. any other thoughts scott or anyone else i have a question what about um pumpernickel <laughs> well um uh, Maybe the pumpernickel might be a healthier grain, but it's still a bread and it's still processed. And so um, if you're looking for really healthy choices, you you eat foods as they're grown in nature. If you want to eat some yellow light foods, that would be a bread. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not a green light food. It's a red it, and it's not a red light, but it would yellow. be a yellow light. So it depends on how much yellow light you want. And what does yellow mean in your mind? Caution. Caution. Be careful because that may not be the healthiest choice for you. So pumpernickel is in the yellow light? Yes. Okay. All I grew up with that. <laughs> now pumpernickel would be yellow light, but white bread that when you crush it, it's like white doughy stuff. That, in my mind, would be a red light. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah. Wonder White Bread. Mm -mm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very good. Right. So if I really have a, a a hankering for it, I go for the yellow one, yellow light, not for yeah. the red. And you, go, and you go for a taste. You don't eat it as a a main meal. You just have a little bit of it a couple little bites and you savor it if you like it that much you just you don't take half a loaf i can't just take, eat two bites <laughs> yeah you take just a bite or two and then you you don't you turn the tv off and the radio off and you don't you turn your phone off and you sit and you savor that one bite or two and you say oh that was satisfying i love the taste of that and that's good you could do that with <laughs> chocolate. You could do that with any food if you use it as a little garnish. And don't you use know it what? as a it food. doesn't work for me. I got to eat more, more, more. <laughs> I think I better you, not have it in the house. Then you've, the, just, okay. you've just identified one of the problems. It may not be that a bite of bread is so bad. It's just one bite is not enough. It's like I eating know, a chip. I know. <laughs> you can't eat one chip. It's not enough. Exactly. And, and that's a problem. So like you say, best not have it in the house. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Best not have it. <laughs> yeah, it, I do that with chocolate and I have somebody else to go shopping for me. And sometimes she brings me chocolate because she knows I like it. And then I have to eat it gone and then no more. I don't want it no more, you know. But every once okay. in a while, the big moon, I have a hankering for it. <laughs> Not have it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to open up and look at the room one more time to see if there are any questions from anybody. Um, D D Doug and Evie there. Huh? Doug and Evie have their hand up. Okay, Doug and Evie. Uh, regard, regarding omega-3, uh, I think you said uh, you have ground uh, flaxseed in the morning? Yes. A Is that what you have it for the omega-3? Yeah, it's one tablespoon of ground flaxseed and a quarter cup of almonds is what I uh, do along with some dulse, which is uh, has omega-3s uh, from the sea, sea vegetable. So what I have kind of like three separate sources. How much dulse? Uh, we use, a, a, I think it's a one ounce package once a month, a piece. So it's not a lot. It's just a small little strip, maybe a couple inches in length from the dulse that's in the package we buy at Whole Foods. It's a very small package. 
it's not a whole lot. I've been having a, a tablespoon of chia seeds. Uh, does that have a significant amount of omega-3? It has omega-3, but not as much as flax seeds. So if you like chia, that's fine. I guess I would do uh, half a tablespoon of chia with a tablespoon of flax. Okay. What about, what regarding regard, regarding uh, uh, people, you know, 60, 70 years ago, I, was look, I had two older brothers. There are pictures of their Boy Scout troop with all, about a dozen kids with their shirts off. They look like they're about 12 or 13. There wasn't an ounce of fat on any of those bodies. And it's like most of them had six packs because there's nothing covering up their, their muscles. That's Just, correct. Yeah. yeah. But that's not what you see today. No, no. Yeah. We've really altered the diet and we're um, uh, actually making our population sick with our diet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you Anybody show, else, Scott? Want me to, yeah, do you want me to show the couple things on the website real quick? Yeah, why don't you do that? You're okay. All right. You've been wonderful of keeping that website up because of Scott. We want to thank him because it's a wonderful resource and totally amazing. And you might also mention the new, um, uh, what is it uh, from Campbell? Oh, yeah, whole communities. I got it on the website now. A link, a link to yeah, it. Yeah, so maybe you could share that after you do. Uh, sure, sure. So everyone that's on the newsletter, you can get to this website. I have the link to this website on the newsletter every week. So it's just livelifestylemedicine.com. So right here, class archives. You just could click on class archives up here on the tab. And there's 2022 classes. Just click on that. And there you go. Here's all the classes starting since January 4th. So it's, there's January, February, March, April. So here's uh, last week's is always here, both on the homepage as well as the, at the top of the, of the list of 2022 classes, the most recent classes there as well as the homepage. And then here's from two weeks ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, right there. So you just, just can watch the archives anytime you want. And then I just gonna add the, some of the new resources that I added here. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, also, I'll go back and I'll show the, um, uh, the Eugene plant-based providers, uh, some of the things that are coming up, some of the events. But here's where I uh, added today. I have it here. Actually, I added this a couple weeks ago, a class flyer, a printable class flyer for these classes if you want to distribute them to anyone, uh, friends, family, whatever, if, they're, they don't, if you don't want to forward the the website to them or anything. But here's another thing I just, just added, whole communities through the Center for Nutrition Studies. You can click on that. It's gonna pull up my profile because I've already signed up, but when you pull it up on your computer, it'll, it'll ask you to, to enroll and it's free and it's just a great resource. Uh, there's more uh, uh, education opportunities there. There's networking, there's all kinds of great stuff. You can actually watch an orientation, sign up for an orientation to see what's all available on, on the website. It's, it's really, really great. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Let me go back to the homepage. Then I, can I just guys... wanna make a comment about that whole communities. Sure. Whole communities, I look at it this way. We've got a community here in Eugene Springfield. We've branched out a little bit to other parts of the nation. Uh, we get an occasional person who comes from the East Coast to the Midwest Coast. But this group of whole communities is pretty much, I believe, worldwide uh, is what they are trying to do, bringing together information and sharing information together like we're doing in these classes. Uh, but it's also composed of a lot of lay people and uh, just people from around the world. So um, it's a valuable resource. Scott shared it with me. I signed up. I think it's valuable. Yeah, great. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah. And then uh, again, here's the where the most recent class is. Here's a tutorial of what's all on the website. You can watch. Here's the most recent class. And then uh, Eugene Plant Based Providers. You can click on that to go to that website. And here it is. And look at upcoming events here. Just want to re remind we have some things coming up. So if you click on upcoming events from the home page, this is just eugeneplantbasedproviders.com. Again, the link right off the website. 
And so we have some grocery store tours coming up. And I just got an update from Sean, who runs this website. He's one. He's a dietitian at McKinsey Willamette. He uh, is in charge of this website. He has told me that there are uh, six slots left on the one coming up on Wednesday, June 8th. So basically a week from tomorrow at the Safeway on Cobra Road at six o'clock. Uh, Sean and Karen will be there. Karen Booth is another dietitian that works at McKinsey Willamette. So they're both dietitians and they're going to do these uh, free grocery store tours. So you can sign up here, name and email and click send. So there's six spots left as of now. There's 14 people signed up for this one. There's still, uh, there's only two people signed up so far for the one that's also going to, it's going to be on Saturday, June 11th. And that's going to be at the Winco uh, that's out, out off Mohawk. And that's at 10 o'clock in the morning. And so there's still 18 slots left. So only two people so far have signed up. I'm actually going to go to this one because uh, uh, I'm going to be still at work. <laughs> usually I'm still at work at six by six o'clock. I'm usually just about ready to leave by then, but um, I'm going to try to go to the, I'll definitely go to the one uh, at Winco at 10 o'clock. So you can sign up for that one if you want. I'm and not sure if I signed up or not. Can I check on that? You just have to just put your name and email in again, just in case, but you'll, you'll receive an email reminder email uh, probably in a few days to remind you about it if you if you're signed up but uh, uh, but yeah you can always just put your name and email in again and click send just to make sure if you if you want I'm sure Sean will be able to tell if someone signs up twice but um, and then on Sunday June 26th so not too much longer until then that'll come pretty quick we're having a, a picnic a, a plant-based uh, potluck so we're joining up with Eugene Veggies, which is another group in the area. And you can RSVP here, name, email, how many people in your party, and all the details and click send there. And then all the details are here. So you can just hover over each of these things, information, location, who, what to bring, door prizes, COVID safety. So, and it's gonna be at Island Park in Springfield. So all the information is here. So check it out, hope, hope to see you guys there. And then you probably see further down, I, might have, I mentioned this before, we're gonna have another walk. We had the walk a couple of weeks ago and we're gonna do another one on July 23rd. But more to, that's, since that's a little bit further off, we'll talk about that more later. But I just wanted to show you all that for Charlie started class, the official class tonight. Any questions about anything on the website there? Okay. So thank you, Scott. And uh, if anybody has a question that comes up, feel free to chime in anytime. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and we're going to talk about autoimmune disorders. And for those of you who uh, don't know what autoimmune disorders are, we'll kind of play a couple videos. You'll get the chance to kind of really understand autoimmune disease, I believe. And uh, we'll try to stop intermittently, take some questions. But I want to introduce you to a number of people who talk about autoimmune disease. And um, so you'll have some resources that you can follow if you happen to have this problem or one of your family members has a problem that you want to try to help them with. Oh, wait, I was going to show one more thing, Charlie, okay. on the website about the, sorry, that's autoimmune disease. About it, it's okay. Okay, yeah, I was going to show the, on the website, go back up. And just click it from here. LiveLifestyleMedicine.com. Um, yeah, and under resources, if you go to uh, books, I wanted to show you the book I recommend for autoimmune disease. So if you scroll down through the book section, which we have books for the some of the different classes, uh, here's uh, well, actually, you could also do fiber fuel technically for. Uh, if you have like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, which will, that's an autoimmune disease we talked about a little bit in the gastrointestinal class, but also this one here, Goodbye Autoimmune Disease by Dr. Brooke Goldner. That's a really good one. She had lupus, put it into remission with a plant-based diet and healthy lifestyle. So that's a good book. And then um, the only other thing I wanted to show was under the video section, there's a really inspiring video I have posted here about autoimmune disease. Uh, scroll down. And it's this one here, Dr. Sarai Stantic. She's a physician who uh, had developed multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease. And it's a really inspiring lecture she gave. Actually, I was actually at this lecture at a conference. I saw, I saw her do this live and 
Um, she put her multiple sclerosis into remission with diet and lifestyle. So it's a really inspiring uh, talk. So I'd really re highly recommend you watch that as well. So that was it. Very Carry good. On. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Uh, we've got a number of videos to share with you and let's go ahead and share. So in order for me to do that, I need to click on this, click on that. <laughs> it's the life of a thousand clicks. And here we go. So this is what happens when you have autoimmune disease. Let's get into autoimmune diseases, what they are, what they do, and the facts you need to know your body. Here's the breakdown. Our immune system is a network of special cells and organs that protect the body from disease and infection. The immune system can tell the difference between self and non-self, basically what's you and what's foreign. With an autoimmune disease, there's a glitch, and your body can't tell the difference, so it makes autoantibodies that attack healthy cells by mistake. There are over 80 different types that can affect almost any part of the body. Some common ones are rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, lupus, celiac, Hashimoto's, and multiple sclerosis. Statistics vary on how many Americans have an autoimmune disease, with the National Institutes of Health estimating 23.5 million and AARDA quoting 50 million. One reason for the difference is how many types of diseases are included in the data counts. Symptoms are as vast as the parts of the body and can include fatigue, muscle aches, fever, depression, and inflammation. It can take a lot of visits to a lot of different specialists to be able to find the right diagnosis. A specialist focuses on treating diseases of a particular system of the body. A rheumatologist treats diseases affecting the joints and connective tissue. A neurologist deals with the central nervous system. And gastroenterologists treat the intestines. The causes of autoimmune diseases remain a mystery to solve, but there are some connecting factors. They can be inherited, so we know genes play a part, and environmental triggers like an infection or chemical exposure can sometimes create an autoimmune response. They're more common in women than men, and some tend to affect certain groups of people. Type 1 diabetes is more common in Caucasians, while lupus is most severe for African Americans and Hispanics. Treatments differ depending on the type of disease, so let's talk to an expert. Dr. Lakshin, what are the treatment options for someone with an autoimmune disease, and is there a cure? Well, there's not really a cure, but in terms of treatments, we have anti-inflammatory drugs, corticosteroids, anti-malarials, and we have drugs called immunosuppressives. So basically, those drugs just keep the body from attacking itself, right? That's the aim of those drugs. I read that diet could impact autoimmune diseases. How do lifestyle decisions factor in? Well, diet works in two ways. Some people think that diseases are actually driven by things that you eat or things that you encounter in your environment. There's no single answer for every patient. You have to experiment. It sounds like autoimmune diseases play by their own rules. So how can we win? The best way is to have doctors talk to doctors from one specialty to another to describe and, and compare and evaluate the patient all as one team. Thank you, Dr. Lakshin. This has been incredibly helpful, and I hope we've helped you to know your body. So that may be kind of the typical information that you get about autoimmune disease uh, going away thinking, well, you know, this is kind of a nebulous topic. We don't know what causes it. We want doctor to talk to doctor. And you know what that leads to? More tests. It leads to what? It leads to more tests, another pill, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to try to mute everybody here because there's a, a little background noise. So I'm going to mute the couple that are not muted and then we're good right now. Okay, so now we're gonna get on and see what uh, the people who we've been following, what they recommend. And we're gonna start with Joel Furman, how nutrition can remove, reverse autoimmune disorder, disease. Uh, we're gonna listen to Dr. Clapper. We're gonna hear from uh, 
the lady that Scott mentioned her book. So let's take a listen. Uh, that's Dr. Brooke Goldner. And we're going to hear from Dr. Greger. So we're going to hear from four people about autoimmune. And someone just turned their microphone on. So I need to go back again and turn their microphone off. So I'm going to mute everybody for now. OK, so let's try to make sure your microphone is off or leave it alone at this point. <laughs> And once we get done with the videos, you'll open it up again. Let's listen to Dr. Furman next. To the podcast, I'm Dr. Lori Marbis, and I'm so honored to have Dr. Joel Furman with us today. How are you, sir? Doing great, excited to be here and talk to you. Wonderful. Well, we have two cases from the journal that we wanna discuss with you today. The first one is efficacy of a plant-based anti-inflammatory diet as monotherapy and psoriasis. And so I think, you know, there is some confusion as to some people, maybe what psoriasis is. Could you give us a little background and just explaining what psoriasis is? Yes. You know, there's more than a hundred different autoimmune diseases where your own immune system is attacking your body in some way. And it generalized, it's, it's related to a degree of heightened inflammation, an autoimmune disease where you attack um, your skin and develop skin plaques is called psoriasis, but it can be associated with a disease like rheumatoid arthritis when you have joint pain joint pain plus the skin disease, then it's usually called psoriatic arthritis. In this case, we're discussing this person did have joint pain and psoriasis, so she really had psoriatic arthritis, and she also had Sjogren's syndrome, which is another autoimmune disease that gives you dry mouth and dry eyes and other symptoms. She mm -hmm. almost had a lupus type syndrome. Lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and ulcerative colitis and multiple sclerosis are also common autoimmune diseases. And I'm suggesting that in my 30 years of practice, I've had it, um, very rewarding and remarkable successes in all those cases with multiple sclerosis, with lupus, with ulcerative colitis, with rheumatoid arthritis, with psoriasis, and with psoriatic arthritis, inducing complete remissions where people did not have to have be sick and have those diseases the rest of their life. And we're using this psoriasis case of psoriatic arthritis case as an example, because most of my 30 years as a busy family physician seeing these people, I didn't keep contact and continue to keep the information to be able to want to write these up and, and write them up as cases, but I've kept in contact with some of these people. And here's a Kate person that I know now because I think she came to me in 2005 or 2006. So this is 15, about 15 years later. Um, and she, it was a remarkable case because she was so ill and she was in, could hardly move in bed for so long taking drugs for psoriasis, for her psoriatic arthritis and had such a limited life. And then when we, when that year when she got well, and got rid of her psoriasis and her psoriatic arthritis completely. She played volleyball, she played tennis, she climbed mountains. She went away to one of her getaways at the Red Mountain Spa and she put her arms up in the air and said, look at me, I'm a miracle. And I said, you're not a miracle. This is just what nutritional excellence can do for people, that these are inflammatory conditions. And it seems like a miracle because the conventional medical approach is to give people chemotherapeutic agents to suppress the immune system instead of excellent nutrition to remove the inflammation and to allow the body to resolve these conditions. And I'm excited to be part and to contribute some of these cases to the journal because I really feel that um, we can definitely, if people are, it's they're suffering greatly and they're not being told that there's an option for them to get well here. Right, absolutely. Okay, so that's from Joel Furman. Now we're gonna go next to, I believe it's uh, Clapper, Michael Clapper. Do you believe that there is a way um, that a plant-based diet can cure autoimmune conditions? Oh my, what an important question. Now, uh, when I was in medical school, if I was told a patient has a diagnosis of lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, this is a lifetime curse. They will never get out from under this. We don't know what causes it, but nobody gets better. Uh, but science marches on and in the intervening years, uh, we see a lot has to do with uh, so-called leaky gut phenomenon. We injure the wall of our intestines and, and especially animal products, the, the fragments of animal muscle and, and nerve and tendon and all those things you bite into when you bite into a chicken breast or a, eat a burger. Uh, fragments of animal tissue get into the bloodstream, antibodies are made against it that then lock onto our own tissues. We get these uh, so-called autoimmune diseases and, put these scary names on them. 
but it has a lot to do with our diet. And now there are many reports in the literature of people who have reversed autoimmune diseases uh, using a whole food plant-based diet and, and judicious use of other supplements and a healthy lifestyle practice, of course, with enough sleep, reduced stress, et cetera. So uh, the answers are resounding, yes, absolutely. And if people want guidance on how to do this, uh, two places to look. Uh, one is go to my website, drclapper.com, and uh, click on answers. And you'll see an article I wrote called Diet, Arthritis, and, and Uncommon Sense. Oh, I think I changed it, Diet, Autoimmune Disease, and Uncommon Sense. Uh, and it, it details uh, how you can use a plant-based diet to help reverse these autoimmune diseases. And I'd also refer you to the website of my good friend and fellow physician, Dr. Brooke Goldner. Uh, she is a, uh, she's a practicing, not only she's a psychiatrist, uh, but she cured herself of lupus, which she got when she was a medical resident. Uh, she was headed for the dialysis machine. She was in terrible shape with this, uh, but she adopted a whole food plant-based diet and lots of uh, green smoothies uh, with ground up uh, omega-3 containing seeds in it. Uh, and goodbye lupus uh, that she was able to say with a big smile on her face. And in fact, her book and her website have that very same title, Goodbye Lupus. So I suggest you do a uh, internet search on that phrase, Goodbye Lupus. It'll take you to Dr. Goldner's website and do follow her program. And uh, you too uh, can be one of the many who've walked right out from under a diagnosis of lupus, ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, yes, uh, these autoimmune diseases are absolutely uh, treatable and usually reversible uh, with a whole food, plant-based, vegan diet. So uh, reason for hope, reason for action. I hope you take advantage of it. Absolutely. Very helpful and very hopeful. Okay, now we're going to hear from Dr. Greger. And then we'll hear from Dr. Golden. These are the journals I try to stay on top of every month, but now I have a new one to add to the list. The International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention, a new peer-reviewed medical journal created to document the science of nutrition and lifestyle to prevent, suspend, and reverse disease, with an editor-in-chief no less prestigious than Dr. Kim Williams, chief of cardiology at Rush, and past president of the American College of Cardiology. I was honored to join their editorial advisory board, along with so many of my heroes, and the best part is it's free. Go to ijdrp.org and put in your email to subscribe for free, and you'll be alerted when new issues are out, which you can download in full for free in PDF form. Instead of preventing chronic lifestyle diseases, we doctors just tend to manage them. Instead of curing, we just mitigate. Why? Because of finance, culture, habit, tradition. Yeah, many of us envision a world where trillions of dollars are not wasted on unnecessary medical care. For this reason comes the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention. After all, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Just to give you a taste, how about pitting plants against one of the most inflammatory diseases out there, lupus, an autoimmune disease in which your body can start attacking your own DNA. Kidney inflammation is a common consequence, and even with our armamentarium of immunosuppressant drugs and steroids, lupus-induced kidney inflammation can lead to end-stage renal disease, meaning dialysis, and death unless perhaps you pack your diet with some of the most you know, anti-inflammatory foods out there, and your kidney function improves so much you no longer need dialysis or a kidney transplant. Another similar case is also presented with a resolution in symptoms and normal kidney function, unless he deviated from the diet. Even just cutting out animal products, randomizing people to cut out meat, eggs, and dairy without significantly increasing fruit and vegetable intake can cut C-reactive protein levels, a sensitive indicator of whole body inflammation, by nearly a third within eight weeks. But with lupus, they weren't messing around. A pound of leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables a day, like kale, fruits like berries and lots of chia or flax, and a gallon 
of water a day, basically a, a green smoothie diet to extinguish lupus flares. Uh, note, though, if your kidneys are already compromised, this should be done under physician supervision so they can monitor your electrolytes like potassium and make sure you don't get you know, overloaded with fluid. Bottom line, with such remarkable improvements due to dietary changes alone, the hope is that researchers will take up the mantle and formally put it to the test. Autoimmune inflammatory skin disease reversals can be particularly striking visually, a woman with a 35-year history of psoriasis unsuccessfully managed uh, for year after year with drugs, suffering from other autoimmune conditions like Sjogren's as well, but put her on an extraordinarily healthy diet packed with greens and other vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, avocados, some whole grains, and boom, before and after. Within a year, she went from 40% of her entire body surface area inflamed and affected down to 0%, completely clear. Oh, and her Sjogren symptoms resolved as well as a bonus while helping to normalize her weight and cholesterol. Speaking of autoimmune diseases, what about the treatment of type 1 diabetes with plants? We'll find out next. And last but not least is uh, Autoimmune Disease with Dr. Brooke Goldner. This is the book. You can meet the person, and then we'll... Continue. Welcome, Dr. Goldner. Thank you so much. Well, it's wonderful to have you here. So let's start with the basics. Dotsie talked a little bit about autoimmune disease and some facts and figures, but tell us what is an autoimmune disease? So you guys are right. Autoimmune diseases are more common than ever before. And what they are are really your immune system no longer functioning in the proper way. So when you think about your immune system, the purpose of your immune system is to keep you safe from foreign invaders, right? You get a virus, if you get a bacteria, then your immune system's supposed to create antibodies that attack and kill that invader and keep you healthy. Your immune system also does other things, like if you bang your knee on the corner of the bed, it gets swollen because your body's sending inflammatory mediators there with all the blood and all the cells necessary to repair the damage. So our immune system is really what keeps us intact and keeps us healthy. But when you've got Problems with your immune system, which we now know are mediated by an excess amount of inflammation, then the immune system stops functioning properly. And instead of just fighting against foreign invasions like bacteria and viruses, it can start attacking your own cells and your own organs because it can no longer recognize the difference. And that's what we call autoimmune disease. And there's many different diseases, as you mentioned, um, and some of them can cause things like arthritis and other ones can actually cause organ failure like lupus where you know it can attack your kidneys your brain your heart your lungs and end up killing people usually at a young age usually pretty young people are affected by diseases like lupus so it sounds like um crossed wires your body starts to not know uh the difference between healthy cells and healthy tissue and unhealthy so it's attacking both but obviously the bad part is it's attacking attacking healthy uh healthy it, tissues and and perfectly healthy cells and actually what ends up happening is the immune system is so out of whack that it can be attacking healthy tissues and not fighting infections right. like i myself had lupus from the age of 16 and i was in kidney failure from lupus but I had a sinus infection that lasted six months because I couldn't fight a cold. My, my immune system was doing all the wrong stuff, and there wasn't a, enough of it left over to do the right thing. But I want to hear your story because it's, it's inspiring um, and set you on this journey to being the doctor that you are, helping people with autoimmune diseases. Can you give us a, a list? Just tell us about some of the diseases that are autoimmune diseases, because I think people might, mm -hmm. certainly I, might think some diseases are, I don't know whether they're autoimmune or not. Yeah. yeah, there's so many. The most common ones we hear about would be lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, uh, scleroderma, and multiple sclerosis. And then there's people who have kind of a, a hodgepodge of symptoms where they might be told they have mixed connective tissue disease, which is just means you have some signs or symptoms of multiple different types of autoimmune disease. And then others who are told you have autoimmune stuff, 
but the doctors don't know exactly which thing it is. And really in my mind, it's all the same. I don't consider that there's 80 autoimmune diseases. Mm. There's an autoimmune process that happens in the body and which antibodies you develop or which symptoms you get might be helpful for the doctor in terms of what he's billing, right? When we're billing, we need a diagnosis. When we're prescribing a medicine and justifying the medicine, we need a diagnosis. But in terms of the process and how it happens in the body, it's really all the same, which is why I'm able to help people reverse any and all of those really with the same protocol, because in terms of how the body's functioning and where the autoimmune disease is coming from, it's really the same thing. And your body doesn't know that it's filling any certain diagnoses. And that's actually a good thing, you know, that you don't need to have a set in stone diagnosis. If you're just starting to have symptoms, you can still change your lifestyle and your diet and reverse those without ever having known exactly which billing code it would have fit into. Right. So is Parkinson's a, an autoimmune disease? Parkinson's is not considered autoimmune per se. Oh. Uh, it is an inflammatory condition. And actually I've had uh, someone with Parkinson's do my rapid recovery program. And uh, that's a four week program where you're, you're stuck having to communicate with me every day and I control your life and <laughs> everything you eat and everything you do. And uh, he actually did my program because his neurologist was interested in my program and wanted to know if it could be beneficial for Parkinson's. Right. So it, it, he was kind of, he agreed to do it, but it wasn't necessarily something he would have looked for on his own. And he ate the pretty standard diet, meat and dairy and all those things. And within four weeks, his symptoms were so much better that his friends and family noticed how much better he looked and his doctor was able to lower his medication dosage. And then after he was done with this four week experiment, he went back to his previous diet and he said he quickly went back to the same condition he was in before he started. And that really was uh, eye opening for the patient to say, whoa, not only did I get better rapidly, but I was able to undo it pretty quickly too by returning to the foods that I used to eat. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging. Okay, I'm going to stop there before we get on to uh, some of the food choices and some of the other conditions. See if there are any questions from anybody. So a lot of that was pretty basic, but I really thought it was important for you to hear from not just one person, not just two, but from a multitude to, for those of you to decide, who do you trust in this world? Uh, if it's one person who's talking, it may be more difficult than a whole group who have had uh, similar experiences. And um, all right, that's all I, I have. have a question. I have a question. Sure. Do, is it, do, do you think that if you start later in life, like in your 50s or early 60s, that it's just too late, that you'll see benefits, but you won't be 100% better, like they're saying. Because I've taken, I've done certain things that they say, well, just do this and you'll be fine. And we'll do that and I'm not fine. Yeah, and so, I'm so that's a good question. Uh, we do have a documentation with heart disease that, uh, if you do um, a totally whole food plant-based lifestyle that uh, there's two studies that document unclogging of the coronary arteries. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's never too late. Uh, I had one lady at 93 or five, she had a heart attack and she went on whole food plant-based diet um, and she was doing much better after six months. She was feeling great. Mm -hmm. So it's never too late for heart disease. It's never too late for diabetes. I don't know that I have enough experience to know whether it's too late for autoimmune disorders. My guess is it probably is not. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the question is, is how much are you following? If you right. have tried things, oftentimes when people try things, they try it to a large degree, but not completely. So, you know, you may go out and eat at a friend's house and they're not serving plant-based mm -hmm. meals or they're serving processed foods or you eat out occasionally. It may be as minimal as once or twice a week, a few mm -hmm. times a month where mm -hmm. you're eating some animal product and you think I'm doing really well because I only, you know, 
am exposing myself to potentially harmful things, just very limited. Mm -hmm. So if you're not getting the benefits you want, I would suggest you do an experiment on your life. And that would be to go 100% whole food, as they're grown in nature, whole plant foods, and mm -hmm. see how you feel at the end of a month or two. And if you're feeling dramatically improved, you may continue to do that. Mm -hmm. The question is, is how bad are your symptoms now? Is it worth doing an experiment like that on yourself? And uh, if you need uh, coaching, uh, it's available to help you make a decision as to whether one food or another seems a reasonable choice. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I, I, I had been pretty, I was doing pretty well for like six months. I was on the, the whole food plant based diet and I thought I was doing well. And then all of a sudden I got a lot of pain and I got, um, then other things started happening to me and then I just, I just stopped. And I'm trying to be good about certain things. You know, I do like my green smoothie with all the greens in it and I, try to eat mostly plant-based but I do sometimes eat meat and yeah, I... so so again you're asking the question is this too late and mm -hmm. I say if you're eating meat even occasionally mm -hmm. even a few times a month mm -hmm. uh, you're not giving yourself an opportunity to really experience the full benefits okay okay but it is your choice. Uh -huh. and, you know, uh, I don't know how you felt when you were doing more whole food plant-based, uh, whether you felt better and then drifted away uh, because of stress issues or, you know, lack of sleep or- uh, Well, other things started happening. I, I broke my ankle and I yeah. wasn't eating quite, I, was, I wasn't eating enough, I don't think. And I lost a lot of weight. <laughs> Yeah, so, so you, you must eat enough, but you mm -hmm. need to keep it in the foods that are foods is grown in nature, and you may find dramatic benefits, again, by mm -hmm. getting back, but totally your choice. Scott, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to say things like heart disease, like you just mentioned, and autoimmune diseases, and uh, specifically to put an autoimmune uh, disease into remission, as we say, uh, that's where you'll find the more strict, you know, the really strict plans like Dr. Esselstyn, who reversing heart disease is strict even within the whole food plant-based realm. And then mm -hmm. like Dr. Goldner, who's trying to put autoimmune diseases in remission, you know, it's, a, it's really strict even within whole food plant-based, lots of smoothies and things like that, trying to calm the inflammation and put it into remission. So there's kind of like if you're just, oh, I have a little arthritis, I want to lower my blood pressure a little bit, I want to reverse my pre-diabetes, you know, you're just losing, yeah, lose a few pounds. Yeah, you could probably do this 80, 90, 95% and probably get the health benefits you want. But if you're trying to, you know, prevent from having to go in and get a bypass surgery because you have heart disease or you have rheumatoid arthritis, that's really in bad and having a bad flare or lupus or MS, then, then that's where, you know, going all in 100%, like Charlie's talking about, would be uh, give yourself the best benefit. And you know, yeah, some people have so much damage to joints that maybe they won't ever get back to, you know, get 100% recovery, but it's still gonna be worth, worth you know, you're gonna feel better. It's still gonna be worth your effort and uh, you're gonna be reducing your risk for you know, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, dementia, extending your life, feeling better, more energy, all those things will be good side effects as opposed to a lot of these medications that patients go on for these autoimmune diseases, which have, are really expensive, have lots of side effects, actually increase your risk for uh, other health problems. So it's, uh, it's kind, of, kind of no downside to it, I should say. Well, what if you're taking medication and you start really going back on the whole foods plant-based diet, then do you just stay in touch with the rheumatoidologist and just try like, stop taking a certain drug and see how that works and then stop taking another one. I don't know. How would that work? Yeah, you do just we, have to, it would depend on what medication you're on for what conditions. And yeah, you'd have to be in, in communication with your medical provider, we would recommend, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Okay, I'll do that. Thanks. Yeah, and I'm here to uh, tell you that 
you can live by eating just whole plant foods. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been doing this for 10 years and uh, the extent of the processing that we generally do is my wife makes some bran muffins, which has a little uh, flour <laughs> in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've lived without touching any meat, dairy or eggs or any animal products. And we've lived without really partaking in, in processed uh, foods to a large, large degree. So it's not something that's impossible to do. We just mm -hmm. made up our mind, our taste buds change. We love what we eat right now. And the same thing can happen to you. Mm. Okay, thank you. We're 73 and going to be 73 and 74. We started at 63. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. thanks for the question. Any other questions? Yes, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. On, on Dr. Clapper's um, video that you showed us, yes. <clears throat> I, didn't, I didn't catch the end of the one side. It was diet, arthritis, and I didn't catch the end of it. Um, uh, I don't know that, that I know exactly what the words were that you're looking for. What um, was that? If I just look up Dr. Clapper, does he have a website? And then I... He does. Uh, it's, uh, I, I don't know if his website's moving medicine forward. Mm. Yeah. Uh, do you have yeah. a... Yeah, that's it. Moving medicine forward. Yeah, Dr. Clapper. Okay. I mean, are you, are you just looking for that particular interview? Is that what you're looking for? No, he, he made reference to this one. I don't know if it was a video and it was called diet arthritis and whatever. Oh. Yeah, I didn't okay. catch it either. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Go um, ahead, Dorothea. Charlie, you mentioned having bran muffins. Yeah. And I have a recipe off of your website um, for bran muffins. Um, and they have whole wheat fiber um, and some other kind of stuff, but not white flour. Is that okay or what? It's a yellow light food. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's a transition food so it's not a whole food it doesn't grow in nature it's been processed we got kind of in the habit of doing that because we thought that that was a healthy choice and and um it's not the healthiest choice it's a yellow light food that's the one uh kind of food that we choose to eat just because i guess at this point would I encourage others to really do that? Only if they're having trouble transitioning and they want something that has a little bit of something they might be somewhat more used to, but not as healthy as eating like oatmeal or bulgur or you know eating a whole grain cereal as opposed to a muffin would be a healthier choice. Yeah, I got that recipe. Well, I think I just said that off of the internet um, where they have a link for recipe. And yeah. that was on there. And another one for pumpkin, pumpkin bread muffin. So yeah. are, are all of those yellow light foods? Yeah, I think that uh, they would be included in the yellow light uh, treats. Yeah, there was a lot of dessert recipes that from the 2019 potluck that we had. And those are a lot of the ones that are posted on the recipe section on our website. So yeah, those would all be kind of yellow light foods, you know, just to have once in a while, you know, for like a special occasion, like a potluck or something or a gathering or something. So what's a uh, yellow light foods and red light foods? And you want to go over that, Scott? Yeah, so it's on the website. You know, if you go back to the anyone that's new and doesn't understand that, I would watch the 
the very first lecture, my introduction lecture from January 4th that I showed on the website there back in the archives. And, uh, and under the resources, I actually do have a traffic light handout, which is the green, yellow, and red light food. So your green light foods is what you want to eat the majority of your calories from, which is your whole plant foods, unprocessed, like, like we're talking about, fruits, vegetables, beans, intact whole grains. Those are your, uh, and even starchy vegetables, those are all green light foods. Eat as much as you want. Yellow light foods are foods that are either higher in, in fat, like, like nuts and seeds and avocados, uh, things like dried fruit, because it's a little bit higher in calorie density, things like pasta, bread, those would be in the yellow light category. They're still healthy foods, but you just consider them caution, right? Yellow means kind of caution. You know, kind of the other way to think about it is, you know, you can run it, you can run run a green light every single time and you should never get into an accident, right? But if you run a lot of yellow lights, you're gonna be kind of playing with fire a little bit. You might eventually get into a crash if you run yellow lights all the time, but but not as likely. But then the red light foods, you don't want to be running red light foods or running red lights very often because you'll get into an accident kind of disease, right? And so red light foods are your, your meat, your cheese, your eggs, your other dairy products, your added oils, and your refined sugars, refined flours, things that are have been stripped of all their nutrients and they're pro highly processed or ultra processed. And then uh, foods that are, you know, of, of animal origin, those are in the, the red light category. Um, that so that's kind of the basics of what the we we could talk about green, yellow, and red light foods. And you can go to the website to actually see the handouts and watch the introduction lecture to get more detail on that. Good questions. So yeah. we're going to play another couple videos and then we'll open up again for some questions. I'm going to share. We're going to go auto uh, sodium. Hey and autoimmune disease rubbing salt in the wound. Let's check this out. Millions suffer from asthma attacks triggered by exercise. Within five minutes of starting exercising, people can get short of breath, start coughing and wheezing, such that lung function significantly drops. But on a high-salt diet, the attack is even worse. Whereas on a low-salt diet, there's hardly a significant drop in function at all. To figure out why, researchers had them all cough up sputum from their lungs, and those on the high-salt diet ended up with triple the inflammatory cells, and up to double the concentration of inflammatory mediators. But why? What does salt intake have to do with inflammation? We didn't know. Until now, the Western diet, high in saturated fat and salt, has long been postulated as one potential cause for the increasing incidence of autoimmune diseases in developed countries. The rapidly increasing incidence of autoimmune diseases may be due to an overactivation of immune cells called helper 17 cells. The development of multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, type 1 diabetes, Sjogren's, asthma, and rheumatoid arthritis at all, have all been shown to involve this T-helper 17-driven inflammation. And one trigger for the activation of those Th17 cells may be elevated levels of salt in our bloodstream. The sodium content of processed foods and fast food can be more than 100 times higher in comparison to similar homemade meals and sodium chloride, salt, appears to drive autoimmune disease by the induction of these disease-causing Th17 cells. Turns out there's a salt-sensing enzyme responsible for triggering the formation of these Th17 cells. Organ damage caused by high-salt diets may also activate another type of inflammatory immune cell. A high-salt diet can overwork the kidneys, starving them of oxygen, triggering inflammation. The more salt they gave people, the more activation of inflammatory monocyte cells associated with high salt intake induced kidney oxygen deficiency. But this study only lasted two weeks. What about long term? 
One of the difficulties in doing sodium experiments is it's hard to get free-living folks to maintain a specific salt intake. You can do what are called metabolic ward studies, where you essentially lock people in a hospital ward for a few days and control their food intake, but you can't do that long term unless you can lock people in a space capsule. Mars 520 was a 520-day space flight simulation to see how people might do on the way to Mars and back. What they found was that those on a high-salt diet displayed a markedly higher number of monocytes, which are a type of immune cell you often see increased in settings of chronic inflammation and autoimmune disorders. This may reveal one of the consequences of excess salt consumption in our everyday lives, since that so-called high salt intake may actually just be the average salt intake. Furthermore, there was an increase in the levels of pro-inflammatory mediators and a decrease in the level of anti-inflammatory mediators, suggesting that a high-salt diet has the potential to bring about an excessive immune response, which may damage the immune balance and result in either difficulties in getting rid of inflammation or even an increased risk of autoimmune disease. What if you already have an autoimmune disease? Sodium intake is associated with increased disease activity in multiple sclerosis. If you follow MS patients for a few years, those eating more salt had three to four times the exacerbation rate, three times more likely to develop new MS lesions in their brains, and on average had eight more brain lesions, 14 in their brain compared to six in the low salt group. So the next step is to try treating patients with salt reduction and see if they get better. But since reducing our salt intake is a healthy thing to do anyway, I don't see why anyone should have to wait. <clears throat>
That's exactly what was suggested recently. Uh, some studies have shown vegetarian diets improve psoriasis symptoms, for example. Maybe this is why speculating a uh, cortisol-potassium theory is a novel mechanism for the beneficial effects of vegetarian diets. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, and we're going to see if you have any questions about salt and potassium in your diet. Any thoughts? Any questions? Yeah, what's the relationship between salt and potassium? I have kidney disease, so I'm wondering how the um, uh, how the potassium affects the kidney. Well. I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. If you add a high salt load uh, into your body, the kidneys have to kind of work harder to, to eliminate the extra sodium. Uh, you don't want too much potassium also, uh, because that can kind of lead to heart arrhythmias uh, if, the cat, if the kidneys are not able to excrete potassium during kidney failure. So there is a balance, but the balance seems to be maintained if you're eating plant foods as opposed to taking pills. When you're taking pills, uh, like adding a whole bunch of salt, sodium chloride into your diet or adding a whole bunch of potassium chloride in the in the form of pills, your potassium levels can get out of whack much more quickly than if you're just eating healthy foods. So I think from these last two videos, it's pretty clear. Uh, you don't want too much salt in your diet. You want under uh, 1,500 to two grams at the most of sodium chloride in all the foods you eat for a day. That's two thirds of a teaspoon of salt or less. And if you, if you eat out or you're eating processed foods, you're probably getting a lot more than that. So if you're preparing your own foods, you're probably able to control the salt and you can have little pinches here and there on your foods for the flavoring. Uh, as far as potassium is concerned, the more fruit and vegetables that you eat, uh, you'll be supplying more potassium, and that seems to have some beneficial effect with steroids, and steroids cut down on inflammation. So, um, you know, we, we got to be careful about focusing on a, a particular nutrient. Uh, we, we need to look at the whole foods that we're eating in our life, focus more of our attention on that. I think Scott makes a good point about that on a regular basis. Scott, do you have anything to add? Yeah, just with the chronic kidney disease, you know, for probably 95% of people with chronic kidney disease, you know, having a, a low salt, unprocessed food diet high in potassium is actually good. The kidneys actually will achieve steady state on your blood potassium levels, no matter what your potassium intake is in your diet after about three days. So the the kidneys really regulate your potassium very closely. So uh, steady state occurs in about three days. So you don't really have to worry about it. Now, if you're in that five to 10, maybe 5% of people with really severe cr uh, chronic kidney disease and you're on dialysis, now, once you're on dialysis, you need to work with your plant bait or with your, uh, your nephrologist, your kidney doctor, as well as a dietitian that is schooled in and educated in how to manage uh, patients diets with dialysis that's very specific so you have to be you know careful with lots of different things but for that those 95 percent of people with with just kind of the run-of-the-mill chronic kidney disease that that I see every day in the clinic uh, a, a basically a, no, a low salt unprocessed whole food plant-based diet high in potassium will actually improve kidney function I have many patients that like one in particular that was getting ready to go see the, the kidney doctor to go on dialysis because his GFR was 18, this number called glomerular filtration rate. And normal is over 60. And usually when you get down below 20, 15 to 20, you're gonna have to go on dialysis. And this patient I had, 
was at 18 on his way to go see the nephrologist. And then I got him on a whole food plant-based diet. And six months later, his, his kidney function increased to 44, from 18 to 44 in six months. So by the time he actually showed up with the kidney doctor, he's like, hey, what are you doing here? Your kidney function, you're not, you don't need to see me. And so that's how, how much of an impact it can have to you know, if the diet and lifestyle change. I have a question. Um, yes. What, what about um, the, um, I have to look at it just a second. While she's doing that, going back to uh, the whole almond food, that's the important part. Almond milk, how, it has a lot of salt in it. How can I get this in my uh, cereal? Uh, let's say the um, the the oat oatmeal. Uh, I'm allergic to the milk, so um, I used to take the almond milk, but the almond milk is high in salt. What can I do? You can grind your own almonds, make your own milk. You just uh, grind the almonds in a, a blender, and uh, you run that mixture through a nut bag and the milk comes out and the almond stuff stays behind and um, you See, haven't added any additional salt. It's easy to do. Is there a simpler way to do it? <laughs> Something uh, to buy that is, that's easier? I don't know that there's anything you can buy because they're gonna wanna put preservatives in it to keep it from spoiling and you know, you're going to be dealing with those cartons, so. You know um, what I'm going to do? I'm just going to take the, uh, the the water and it's it's the, um, the one that's in the plastic bottles. Does that work? Um, For the plastic? Water, if you use water and it's forget. Water. Yeah, you could use water uh, if you want some liquid with the cereal. Uh -huh. uh, there's no requirement that you have something that's white or milk for breakfast. Yeah. In fact, most uh, other mammals are weaned off of milk at a young age and they never touch milk again. So there's no requirement for it. What about the plastic bottle in, in, the, um, in the water? Does uh, it leak? You down? want BPA free plastic bottles. Just make sure they're. Um, BPA free. Um, I wouldn't know how to go about that. <laughs> I just checked. We have both oat milk and almond milk in the refrigerator, and the oat milk has significantly less sodium. Which one uh, has? Oat. oat. Oat milk. Oh, okay. Oat milk. Yeah. So that's a good option. Dr. Esselstyn likes oat milk. Okay. And how much salt does it have in there? The, it, okay, the almond milk for eight ounces has 140 milligrams yeah, or I, micro, whatever it is. And the oat milk has 100. 100 milligrams. So that's a 30%, roughly 30%. It's a little less, yeah. yeah. Okay. The other Thank way to you. look at it, yeah, the other way to look at it too is you want the calories and the sodium to be one to one or less. And so you want, that's a, when I do the food label reading class, uh, that's kind of the Jeff Novick rule for processed foods is if you, you want the milligrams of sodium to be the same or less than the number of calories per serving. So if something has 140 calories per serving in any food, you want the milligrams of sodium to be 140 or less. And that's the one to one rule because that's uh, if you think about people eating about 2,300 calories a day, then you'd be at 2,300 milligrams of sodium a day. So that, that, that puts you at the top end of what's kind of the recommend, recommended. So, uh, of course, it's the processed foods is where 70, 80% of all the sodium comes from in the diet. So if you're not eating foods that don't have a label, for the most part, fruits, vegetables, beans, whole grains, you're not going to be getting all the added salt already. So you're going to be, or you're going to be way ahead of the game there. I take the distilled water, I think. I okay, can that works. <laughs> that works. I've found that in 
Um, I forgot what I was gonna say. Um, oh yeah, um, vegetable broth. Um, they have one that's both sodium. That's yeah. what I use. We do too. We use the low sodium Ooh. vegetable broth. Okay, so uh, we're going to see if we have any more questions. Uh, now's the time to speak up. We have. Yeah, Kim. See, one, two, three, four, five more videos, which I guess we can share next time with. Um, and I heard a, a voice in the background. Yeah, it's uh, Ken. Hi, Ken. I have a, Charlie, I have a hard time not laughing when I hear the word nutbag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so, where, so where do you get this nutbag? So you can go online on uh, at Amazon, um, and it's a a bag that has tiny holes in it, and you can just kind of, you know, grind blend up uh, nuts. Uh, you can do almonds, or you could do. Uh, some people use soy, um, but. Uh, I'm most familiar with almond. You grind it up and it's a white kind of pasty mixture and you dump it into this bag and then you squeeze it like you're milking a cow's udder and out comes uh, the milk. Uh, it's almond milk. No additional agreement. They said they're a, um, a marketing site called Vagabond. Is that what you said? Uh, no, I didn't say that, but on Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> um, and while I have the mic, you know, I make my own uh, salt-free broth, except what's naturally in the vegetables. And there's a lot of, I have to follow a recipe. If I don't, I get some weird tastes. Um, I got to follow a recipe. There's a lot of recipes out there. I'll share some sometime when I'm at home. Uh huh. So that's All just right. my I follow. Broth is great for cooking so, uh, soups, soup base. Um, I fry in it. Well, I I stir fry in it. Um, but but my my message is follow a recipe, please. All right, so there's no not much in the recipe following here. If you go online to Amazon, you can buy for $6.99 four pack nut milk bag for straining. So it's $7 for four of these. You can use these bags um, multiple times. You have to clean them out each time, which is kind of a little pain, but um, they last for a long time and uh, you can make your own almond milk pretty easily. What else? We have a couple more minutes left. What do you do with the almonds? Uh, eat them. <laughs> you used to make, put it in the muffins or in some other stuff that she was baking. This is when we first started doing this and then she took to kind of using it in the compost pile after a while. Um, we use cat. We use uh, raw cashews to make a, a cashew cream or cashew milk. And I don't, the particulate matter is, I think, significantly less than with almonds. Okay, it's, that's it's really a... soft. You don't have to strain it through anything. You just grind it up in a in our blender, and you have. You have cashew milk. Okay, so that's Virgil another Virgil made option. a salad dressing using cashews like that too, and it makes a really good creamy garlic dressing. Sounds good. And you can get the unsalted bulk at Winco and stuff where you can just measure out what you want. Cool. All right, any other thoughts? We're starting to have fun now. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, Sherry. I thought on the reduction of salt, um, it said that I don't remember how many millions of people um, have um, exercise induced asthma. Yeah. And, 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 um, and that kind of that hit close to home to me because I've had that, you know, for years and years. And but um, I don't know, three or four weeks ago, um, I went off the drugs I was taking for it. And thus far, I feel fine. So baby steps. Yeah. So what you're saying is you started on a whole food plant based diet. You've been following it for how long now, or as best you can, for how long? Uh, probably two months. I'm not a hundred percent. Okay. But I'm probably eighty-five percent. I'm I'm not sure. And um, I was to a doctor last week, and um, with an issue I have going on, and. I, I told him that I was probably 85%, um, you know, plant-based, whole foods, plant-based diet. And he goes, oh no, you can't do that. You need protein in order to heal what's going on. And I said, beans works. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't have enough education to yeah. elaborate further. Yeah. Um, but his reaction was quite strong. I was surprised. Well, unfortunately, there are a number of um, medical providers who don't have any uh, nutrition education, do not have any understanding whatsoever. I know. And uh, it's good for their return business uh, <laughs> if they tell you <laughs> stop getting healthy. Uh, because, you know, you won't need to come back and see me. They don't really have that understanding. Right. Uh, but if uh, you can show him uh, that your asthma is improved and that your other, you know, your weight is coming down a bit and you're, you know, otherwise getting off of medicines, he may come to the realization after he sees a couple more of you, a couple more patients, Maybe there is something to this and uh, maybe people are getting enough protein. Maybe you'll come to one of our lectures someday and, uh, <laughs> and learn about the science. Well, and, and maybe in the future, I'll be, able, I'll be able to elaborate better too. Yeah, that's, it, it's tough. Let me tell you, I, it's tough for us to convince someone like that, uh, let alone uh, you who've only been doing this for two months. Yeah. Um, so good for you for hanging in there and for understanding that he doesn't really want to make you feel worse. He just doesn't understand. I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anybody else like to share something for the good or whatever before we terminate the session? We still have some time. Charlie? Yes, go ahead, Mary. Um, uh, I started a new plan. My, uh, uh, my A1C is quite high and I've been doing metformin and Victosa. And I came up with a plan because it wasn't getting better. Um, I'm dealing with a lot of stress and a lot of hours at work. And, but um, the, uh, I, I actually, have a chef now who makes me um, food and financially it's not as expensive as it first seemed, but I do breakfast very well. I start out every day really strong. And then if I don't, um, if I, if I don't have the right food around, then I'm, I'm, you know, it's many hours later and I'm hungry and I'm tired and I get something. Um, I'm not doing McDonald's or anything like that, but Anyway, I was losing my battle with uh, my A1C was rising every every three months, just a little bit, a little bit, and it's too high. So I put this plan in place. So I do breakfast on my own, which I do well. And then I got meals delivered to me made by a chef and I had to educate her on 
whole plant-based foods. I, I bought her the How Not to Die cookbook by Dr. Greger. Good. Learning a lot. And it's turning out really well for me. It's um, my, my uh, CBGs in the morning have come down from the high 280s down to 170s now in just about a week and a half. Nice. Doing it. And then I save fruit for the evening. So um, that's, it's working out. I think it'll get better as I improve too, but it, it really does work. And I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about um, my own personal power to make a change in the midst of feeling as tired as I am right now. Yeah. So kudos to you for, um, you know, giving this some further thought and doing what needs to be done. And sometimes when, you know, you're not feeling as well, you're feeling tired or whatever it is, uh, maybe even losing some hope, uh, yep. you kind of get sucked down into a black hole and it's kind of hard to get out of it. Swelling. Com coming to these classes uh, hopefully can kind of inspire you a little bit to get back on track and, and get the health that back that you deserve. Yeah, well, it's a plan and it's new. And so far I'm seeing some, some results and I think it'll only get better the more stringent I get with it. So we'll see in three months. Great. <laughs> Here we are. Thanks for sharing. Virgil. Yeah. I just uh, recently had a uh, ultrasounds on the carotid arteries. You remember last August I had this one here cleared out. It was, it was uh, seriously a problem. And anyway, the uh, ultrasound showed uh, improved numbers. This is on the other one that wasn't cleared out. I'm, yeah. I'm, well, on both of them, actually, I'm, I'm, the numbers have gotten better. They're not as, the one on the right is not as great as I'd like, but it's gotten better. So the, nice. the diet the diet is helping in, in, in small steps, little bits at a time, but it is making an improvement uh, a little bit at a time, so. And instead he of a, has to go once a year instead of every six months. Yeah. I'm down okay. just once a year instead of six months. So uh, progress is being made, not as fast as I want, but uh, I, I don't, I guess I, I don't always behave myself and uh, I cheat occasionally. So that's my mm. fault. That, that falls back on me. Maybe the numbers be better if I didn't do that. But uh, on the most part, we're real good. Yeah, but, you know, once in a while, I just I fall off the wagon. There you go. Welcome to the human race. Yeah. <laughs> no a movies. Of, a lot of health benefits no movies. Aren't, don't get a lot of health benefits don't get reflected in numbers or tests necessarily either. So don't get too narrowed in on what your numbers are. You know, it's also how you feel and and just you know your overall knowing what you're doing with your overall health with what you're choosing to eat it's not always going to show up in a in an ultrasound or a number necessarily so uh, the nutritious yeast on popcorn yeah i use a little spritzer i spray a little water on it and then put the yeast on it sticks to it instead of falling to the bottom of the doesn't bowl. all go to the bottom of the bowl yeah you oh, just yeah. put a little spritz of water on it mix it up and spritz it and mix it up and uh, it sticks to the popcorn better, much yeah. better. We had to buy a spritzer so it wasn't a streamer that melted the popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thought. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? What's an A1C? Hemoglobin A1C. It's a kind of a measurement of uh, the your blood sugar levels uh, over the previous three months. Okay, blood sugar, okay. It, it gives you an average uh, level. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, we've had fun. We're gonna do some more next week. We'll <laughs> kind of carry on and I know we'll probably have more questions and I don't know what else to say. Anybody else have anything before we go? Scott, any other thoughts? You good? Yeah, do you have some videos on, I don't know, I didn't look to see what videos you hadn't showed, shown yet. Do you have anything on thyroid and just general arthritis like osteoarthritis? It's all on, kind of similar. 
who will do some arthritis, uh, multiple sclerosis, and uh, touch Crohn's again, and those sorts of things. Okay. So We're going to be absent next week, but we'll be looking for you in the movies. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Charlie. That was wonderful. Trouty, Trouty, thank you for your questions, and it was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're all welcome. Bye. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.